Over the past few weeks, we've looked at tanks and specifically where they get their names from. We've looked at German tanks and why some of them were named after big cats, and also why British tanks seemingly were named after words with the letter C. However, another interesting thing to look at is how British aircraft got their names. Some of the most iconic aircraft, such as the Spitfire for example, gained its name from a nickname after the head of Vickers Aviation used the name for his daughter Annie, calling her a little Spitfire. In fact, RJ Mitchell, the famous Spitfire designer, wanted his iconic plane named the Shrew. Imagine that. In this video, we'll look at the rules that the Royal Air Force and the British military have in naming their different aircraft. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. The system we're going to look at has been used since the end of the First World War. Every aircraft used by the RAF has its designation, which is made up of a name, a role prefix and also a mark number. In February 1918, a unified official naming system was introduced by the Ministry of Munitions and the scheme would use the classes of planes related to the roles of the aircraft. For example, fighter aircraft would be named after animals, planets or have a nature theme or with bomber aircraft being named after places. The name of a specific aircraft would have to be agreed between the aircraft's manufacturer and also the air ministry or the admiralty, depending on who it was going to serve. We'll now look at these different classifications in detail and also look at some examples. So one common theme that goes throughout British aviation is alliteration. For example, similar to tanks, Vickers Armstrong, a British engineering conglomerate, would use the letter V when naming their aircraft. Also the company Hawker would select words that began with the letter H, for example the iconic Second World War aircraft, the Hawker Hurricane, which had a huge role in the Battle of Britain. It's clear that using alliteration may have been a common theme throughout the British military, and by companies using alliteration, this could have been a further marketing ploy, sealing their stamp on the aircraft. So heavy bombing aircraft shares a very traditional pattern. Throughout the Second World War, these were used very effectively with the bombing of industrial towns towards the end of the conflict, when the Allies gained air supremacy. Planes such as the Lancaster Bomber or the Avro Lincoln would fly over these German towns and drop their payload of weapons to maximum effect, striking a crushing blow to German industry, and in particular the war effort, with strikes on the armaments industry. However, the heavy bombing aircraft are named after cities or towns that can be found within Britain. For example, Lancaster is a relatively small city found in the northwest of England, and Lincoln is a city found in the East Midlands, and is known for its castle, which we previously visited, and also its cathedral, which was once the tallest building in the world. Other examples are the Hanley Page Halifax and the Short Stirling. Both of these saw action in the Second World War, with Halifax being a town in Yorkshire, and Stirling being found in Scotland. Also, some transport aircraft which were deployed by the RAF use towns as their names, such as the Hanley Page Hastings or the Blackburn Beverly. Flying boats may not be the first thing you think of when you think of aircraft that belong to the British military. However, these were used during the First World War and also the Second World War. During the latter conflict, they would sink numerous submarines and manage to locate many different enemy ships. One of the most famous flying boats is the Catalina, but more on this later. Typically, British flying boats were named after towns centred around coastal regions or port communities. For example, the Sarrow London, the Short Sunderland and the Supermarine Stranra, with the last two adhering to the idea mentioned earlier on alliteration. So it's not just the RAF who would deploy British military aircraft as I'm sure you know, the Royal Navy would use and deploy a number of aircraft as well. One type of this is a maritime patrol aircraft, which was used to locate targets overseas. These aircraft could operate over a long duration and distance, and were used particularly in anti-submarine and anti-ship warfare. They were also deployed in search and rescue missions, and were considered a very important resource. They could also carry torpedoes and sonar boys, and were supposed to fly at lower altitudes. Their names, however, were a lot more interesting than simply place names of towns. These aircraft were named after naval explorers, men who would go and explore new lands and report on their findings. Famous examples of these are the Avro Anson, named after George Anson, who attempted to circumnavigate the world during the 18th century and commanded a fleet that defeated the French during the War of Austrian Succession. There's also the Lockheed Hudson, named after Henry Hudson who explored parts of Canada and the United States. 
The Avro Shackleton is a beautiful aircraft that I was lucky enough to see when I visited Newark Air Museum. This aircraft of course is named after Ernest Shackleton, Shackleton obviously being an extremely famous Antarctic explorer who led three different British expeditions to the area. Army cooperation and liaison aircraft were mostly used during the conflicts as a way of transporting messages and commanders, but also for observational purposes. Some were even deployed as air ambulances on battlefields, so their use was extremely varied. Their names are shared by the glider family, and the pattern is linked to mythological or legendary leaders of war or armies. The Western Lysander was one of these aircraft, with Lysander being a Spartan admiral, who commanded the Spartan fleet which defeated the Athenians in 405 BC. The airspeed Horsa glider was deployed in a large amount by the RAF and was even used in the opening stages of the invasion of Normandy in D-Day. Horsa is a legendary brother, the other being Hengist who is said to have led the Angles, Saxons and the Jutes in an invasion of Britain in the 5th century. Horsa's existence is even found in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, in which it says he was invited to Britain to help him fighting against the Picts. So it wasn't and isn't just British aircraft that are deployed by the RAF, they throughout history have bought or even borrowed vehicles from America. In terms of their names, they tend to pay respect to their country of origin and have a link to the United States, for example the Catalina or the Baltimore. Also the RAF tend to keep their American names of their aircraft too, without being too radical in changing them. We've already looked at maritime patrol aircraft, however like I said the British Navy do and still do require British aircraft to be used upon aircraft carriers and in different ways too. Naval aircraft tends to have the prefix C before the original name of the aircraft, so you'll see aircraft such as the Hawker Sea Hurricane which was just a Hawker Hurricane deployed by the Royal Navy. Also there's the de Havilland Sea Venom or the Sea Vixen. These were both used by the Royal Navy during the 1950s and the Cold War. The previous aircraft we just mentioned were not originally ordered by the fleet air arm of the Royal Navy, however those aircraft that were, were specifically given different names. For those aircraft that were, they all had nautical themes or links to the sea. You have aircraft that belong to this such as the amazing looking Fairy Gannet, the Supermarine Walrus and the incredibly named Blackburn Rock. Inside this designation, you also find torpedo bombers, and these were specifically given fish names. Now the fish names used were rather fearsome fish, and don't expect to find an aircraft called the Supermarine Cod or the Hawker Sidley Haddock. They tended to adopt names such as the Blackburn Shark, the Fairy Swordfish or the Barracuda, which are much more menacing. An extremely important part of the British military's aircraft however, is their training aircraft. These have an extremely interesting naming pattern, as the idea of training or education is carried on throughout. The training aircraft tend to use names that are related to academic institutions or successful universities, for example the Airspeed Oxford or the North American Harvard, both extremely prestigious academic institutions. Sometimes alternative names for teachers were also used, such as the Percival Provost. Before I wrap up the video, there's just a few other points I'd like to point out. Within different manufacturers, there are usually links or trends that are used when it comes to naming their aircraft. A good example of this is with the manufacturer Hawker, who as mentioned earlier, developed the Hurricane aircraft. Now Hawker also developed the Typhoon and Tornado, but not the more modern planes that you are more familiar with, so the Hawker manufacturers tended to stick to strong winds when naming their aircraft during a specific point in time. Finally, there's one specific type of class to look at, which we'll look at in more detail at a later date. The V-class of bomber aircraft, known as the V-bombers, that featured the Vickers Valiant, the Avro Vulcan and the Hanley Page Victor. The V-bomber force was a nickname given to Britain's three bombers during the Cold War, that were capable of delivering the nuclear bombs that could have been used to make up part of Britain's nuclear deterrent. We'll look in more detail at this class of aircraft later on, but there certainly is a link between the use of the letter V to begin the names of these bombers. We hope you've enjoyed this look around why different aircraft that were deployed or are deployed by the British military or the RAF are named their specific way. Thank you for watching, to support our channel please make sure to subscribe and also check out some more of our videos, we have over 100 now on the channel so hopefully you can find something that you find quite interesting. Once again thank you for watching.